Just give me a, a notice after 20 minutes if I talk too much. You've already heard me today. I think uh, uh, I want to. It's very important. Give uh, enough space to. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> to someone else. <laughs> In any case, um, I think a good way of getting into the subject of what I call the Zionist mindset is to read the diaries of the Zionist uh, early settlers. There were two groups of early settlers of Zionism. The first who came in the late 19th century were more classical colonialist type of settlers. Uh, like colonialists elsewhere in the world, they came to exploit the resources of the land, including the human resources of the land, in order to make better life for them compared to the countries of origin. And colonialists, white settlers, all over the world, the same period, and indefinitely before that period, uh, were building similar models for exploitation and oppression of the local indigenous people for their own sake. However, they were not the people that created the Zionist movement on Palestine, in Palestine. The people who really molded, really formulated Zionism the way we know it came in what historians like to call the second wave of Zionist settlement. Or in Hebrew they call it Aliyah Shnia, the second uh, ascendance. They came after 1905, after the failure of the first attempt of the Bolshevik movement to uh, topple the Tsarist uh, regime in Russia. And many of them were revolutionaries at heart who believed up to 1905 that the international revolution would provide a solution to what they called the Jewish problem in Eastern Europe. But the failure of that revolution, or that coup, uh, has moved them into the direction of nationalism. And they were very poor compared to the early settlers, the second wave, very poor, and had very little uh, money on them when they arrived in the port of Jaffa. They knew nothing about how farming and agriculture, because as you know, Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe were not allowed to work on cultivation of land, and uh, had nowhere to stay, and didn't know how to make a living for themselves in the new country called Palestine. So they were very lucky that the local Palestinians hosted them, offered them a place to sleep, a little bit of food, and when they stayed long enough also taught them how to cultivate the land and how to shepherd the herds and how to become sort of children of the new country. But at night, these settlers, under the candlelight, wrote diaries. They were obsessive diarists. Diarists. They wrote a lot of, every day they wrote in a diary, uh, which is good for the historian. They wrote about everything. Uh, a mosquito bite, they didn't sleep well, uh, a lot about the women they didn't like, the women didn't like the men, the men didn't like the men. Uh, but there is nothing that escaped the diary. And in those diaries, in those entries to the diaries, they write about their greatest disappointment to be in Palestine. They were, the main disappointment was that the place was full of foreigners. <laughs> Especially those, of course, who hosted them. They were the main foreigners. And they were saying in their diaries, and I'm staying tonight in the house of one of these foreigners. And you have to understand this mindset. The mindset is, and hasn't changed, 
It hasn't changed. There, there were two disappointments here to a certain extent. One was that most of them believed the propaganda that Palestine was an empty space, that it was a land without people, waiting for people without land. They really believed it. Uh, if you read the uh, propaganda of the Zionist movement after Herzl founded it properly in 1897, Palestine appears as a totally empty land. It's amazing. So they were really, really surprised to see someone else there. Secondly, they had to square this new uh, effect with their idea of creating a new homeland. So they decided if someone was there and was not supposed to be there, they were aliens, hostile aliens in fact, who usurped, took over something which did not belong to them. Now, if you think that this is simplistic, if you think that this is outdated, uh, think twice. The most important tool for studying the Arab-Israeli conflict in the United States of America today, whether it is in high school or colleges or in the universities, is an atlas called the Atlas of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, which was written by one of Britain's leading, leading professors called Martin Gilbert. I think it's already in its 12th edition. Right. And this is the main tool by which students in America, and until recently in England, more or less until I came over, but not because of me, or maybe because of me, I don't know, until recently also in England, was the main cartographic way of looking, or geographical way of looking at the conflict. And I think it tells you a lot of the Zionist propaganda today compared to the Zionist propaganda in the early days. Martin Gilbert's atlas has, uh, as I say, is a professional tool that most academics in America use in order to understand the history of Palestine. Okay? The first map is Palestine during the biblical times days of the Bible. The second map is Palestine during the Roman time, at the time that the Jews allegedly were expelled by the Romans. The third map is the Crusader. The fourth map is the first Zionist settlement in 1882, which means that between 70 AD, or between the time of Christ, Till the late 19th century, nothing happened in Palestine, because it was empty, because there were no people there. And this mindset is still there in Israel. This is Zionism for me. This is really Zionism for me, because Zionism is not saying there are no Arabs around. Of course the people know that there are Palestinians around. They are now, as Ali said uh, today, they are half of the population of Manda, what used to be historical Palestine today, are Palestinians. So you don't deal with a Jewish community that doesn't know that Palestinians uh, exist. But the whole effort is on two levels. One is to make the Palestinians evaporate, disappear, so that we can go back to the land without people. Or, if they, you cannot do this, if you cannot do this, imagine that they are not there. Now, how can you imagine that they are not there? You can build a wall. Many people think wrongly that the wall is meant mainly to enclave the Palestinians. But this is the wall that you are familiar with, the apartheid wall, between, with inside the West Bank and between the West Bank, uh, is not the only wall in Israel. Most of the Jewish well-off communities in Israel that are near Palestinian villages have high walls, higher than the segregation wall. If you have a high wall, you are in a land without people, for the people without land. And this is the two ways that Zionism is operating. Now what wrongly is called in Germany the Zionist left, or the peace camp in Israel, are the people who live in these gated communities. 
And they are really minimalists. They are minimalists. They want only a small part of Palestine, it's true. Provided it's purely Jewish. This is merits. This is the Peace Now movement in Israel. This is probably the worst kind of Zionist manifestation of goodwill that we have. <laughs> this is the idea, and I know these are my friends. I came, from this, I came from this milieu, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. This is the kind of people who are very nice, and they are really nice. You know them. You adore them in Germany. You give uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, H, Yoshua, and Amos Oz. You give them prices, uh, although they're horrible writers, but that's, that's another issue. But you give them prices like as if they have written the Bible, the Quran, and the New Testament together. And, uh, and all these human creations are nothing compared to their amazing stories. They're just uh, watching the, uh, what is it, the Goethe Prize, I think, that, uh, or the other ones that, that you are bestowing on these uh, mediocre writers uh, is one of the most embarrassing uh, human ceremonies to watch. But nothing bad, that's a German problem, and that's your idea of culture after the Second World War. Sorry? German loves prices. Yeah, they love prices. Uh, so you have to deal with what is German culture today. It's, uh, some, it's another victim of I think the Holocaust and the Nazi era, but I won't go into it without being too offensive about it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the, this is very important to understand because, humanly speaking, this minimalist Zionist approach was within the Zionist movement from the very early period. Just give us a little piece of Palestine. And it sounded so convincing. We are willing, in 1936, this peace movement within Zionism said, you know, one third of Palestine, that's all we want. But of course, with no Arabs in it. And this didn't seem racist to anyone. It seemed like these are amazing people. Look, all they want is one third. And then, and this is the inner logic of peace Zionists, or what I call diet Zionists. This is like diet coke. It's Zionism without the cocaine. Um, the logic is when I offered the Palestinian in the 30s 70 percent and they said no, of course it doesn't stand to reason that I would offer them again only 70 percent. Uh, they have to learn a lesson because they're Arabs and they're a bit like children. So they have to be, we have to be a bit didactic with them. Since they did not accept the 70 percent, we're now offering them 60 percent. But the Palestinian movement being an anti-colonialist movement, which is something difficult for Europeans to grasp because there are many Muslims among the Palestinians. And the Muslim anti-colonialist movement is not like Che Guevara and the, the people that people like here as anti-colonialists. They don't look, they don't have these cigars and barrettes and the, <laughs> they shave or they don't, if they don't shave they have proper beards. So, they don't fit well into this anti-colonialist image. You can't sort of put them on big posters, right? <laughs> Imagine Yasser Arafat on a t-shirt like Che Guevara. It doesn't work. So, people forget that actually they are an anti-colonialist movement. They are not different from any other movement that the left has cherished in many ways. And, and therefore, when this movement uh, says rightly, 40% of our homeland is something a proper anti-colonialist movement cannot accept. Under any conditions, it cannot accept that 60% of its homeland would be in the hand of a colonialist movement. Then comes the third wave, and you're offered 40%. And I don't have to tell you, you know the story. This, I think that we have to focus on that mechanism, because as I said this morning, the sort of mainstream Zionist approach, and definitely the right-wing Zionist approach, is very transparent. And it's a waste of time in this milieu where we're sitting here together as friends to say to you why the present Israeli government represents a kind of Zionism that we should not accept and detest and abhor. That's an easy one. Even the Kadima uh, uh, Likud government or the Kadima Labour government that did the 2006 second assault on Lebanon or the Gaza massacre, it's not, it's not something we should waste time on and explaining why this is, this is a bunch of criminals and so, and so on and we should oppose them and so on. I think our real problem are not these people. 
Because these people would do the job for us at a very 